All right, everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is David. I am the Assistant Director of uh, Graduate Recruitment at the University of New England. Uh, we're pleased that you have joined us this evening. Um, our program this evening is going to be last about an hour or so. Um, uh, basically, the outline is going to be, uh, you know, we'll have the panel introduce themselves and my colleagues here, Jessica Sun will introduce themselves. Uh, then we'll jump right into question and answers. So please post all your questions in the Q&A section um, uh, so that we can uh, have our panelists answer them. We will be recording, we are recording this session. So if you have to jump off or if you join us late, uh, we'll, we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel. Uh, so with that, I guess we'll have uh, everybody introduce themselves. Uh, Jessica, Sani, you want to start first? Yeah, my name is Jess, and I'm one of the admissions coordinators for the PA program. Hi, everyone. I'm Cassandra, and I also work with Jess and David in our Office of Graduate Admissions with the PA program. All right, students, can you want to start? Yep. Uh, I'm Matt. I'm a first year PA student at uh, UNE. I'm Jake. I'm also a first year PA student at UNE. I'm Ari. I'm another first year student here at UNE. And I'm Brendan. I'm also a first year at UNE. All right. Thank you. So um, why don't we just go down the line? Um, Jake, if we could start with you, uh, just talk, 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 talk to us about uh, where you're from and why you chose UNE. Yeah, um, I'm originally from Minnesota, so the great Midwest. Um, I went to school in Wisconsin for four years, started as a biochem major, changed after like four days to biology because the Krebs cycle sucks. Um, Ooh, I'm trying to think what else just like patient care kind of stuff or just like why I went to UNE I really wanted to move somewhere other than the Midwest so that was like the biggest reason I came to Maine and uh it was just it really it was it was mainly location um and I'm glad I got here because it's it's very beautiful but yeah that's that's probably the biggest reason for me Anything? all right you want to go next yeah, so I'm from Saco, Maine, so I'm right next door to UNE. Um, and in addition to the location, um, I'm wanting to work here afterwards. I knew I'd be able to like make good connections um, in the area during clinicals and whatnot. Um, but also UNE has a really good um, program, and I like the geriatric component about it because I worked in the area, and I've noticed how important it is for that to be um, incorporated into our education. Matt, you want to go next? Yeah, no problem. Um, so I'm from like the greater Boston area, just outside of Boston. And uh, for me, I UNE was one of my top choices. I wanted to stay around the Northeast. I uh, um, went to undergrad in New Hampshire, and then I did a master's program at UVM. So I, I really like the Northeast. And for me, like Maine was a, a good middle ground, I think. Um, and then the reputation that UNE had, um, especially all their PAs, um, there's nothing but good things said about them usually in the Boston hospitals. So it was um, kind of an obvious choice for me. Right then. I, uh, I grew up in Maine as well uh, as Ari, and um, I was really attracted to UNE because of the rural medicine aspect and there's nothing like a Mainer serving a Mainer in my opinion. Very good. So um, I guess we'll jump into the questions. Um, so one of the questions uh, that's posted is, what is your favorite class during didactic year? I probably have one that uh, no one else will say, but I think anatomy was my favorite, my favorite class in didactic. It's probably the biggest one and it's probably the hardest to some people, but you, you you have it only in the summer. You have it a lot, and it's a lot. But it was super fun. There's a great professor here that really helps you through the whole way. She she's amazing. Um, yeah, and I had a lot of fun. You get to go in lab. You get to play around with cadavers. Like, who doesn't love that, right? All 
Anybody else want to answer the question or? Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm with uh, Jake as well. I'm more of a hands-on person. That's how I learn um, visual. And so I really enjoyed the anatomy um, component that we have. I know some other PA programs around us uh, don't necessarily have a gross anatomy lab. Um, so it, it was definitely a pull for me um, to come here because of that. And uh, again, we had an awesome professor who really makes learning really hard material manageable. All right, so in the interest of seeing a different course, my favorite was actually bioscience. It was uh, like the base to pretty much everything you need to know for ClinMed and ClinAssess, so bioscience for me. I also really liked anatomy. I'm definitely a visual learner as well. Um, but this fall, I'd probably say, I guess, clinical medicine, just because that's where we're learning the bulk of all the knowledge that's going to be really important. And that, that's where we spend most of our time right now. Very good. Um, so one question is, another question is, what's the dress code during didactic? Um, business casual, I would say. Obviously, right now I'm not wearing that, but I'm not in class. Um, and there's there's been talks of like semi-formal Fridays or something. So, I mean, sometimes you can wear different things. And for Halloween, you can dress up as costumes. But mostly, yeah, business casual for guys like slacks, um, dress pants, khakis, and then collared shirts. We also get to wear scrubs sometimes um, when we have labs. In the summer, we wore scrubs a lot more just because we were in anatomy lab a lot. And then we also had a clinical assessment lab. Um, and then this fall, it's pretty much just Tuesdays that we get to wear scrubs. But yeah, business casual is definitely like kind of like a wide variety. But for the most part, for girls, I'd say pretty much like any pants that aren't jeans or leggings or sweatpants with like a school appropriate top and you're good. Okay. Uh, another question. What do you believe is the biggest difference between undergraduate life and PA school? Uh, I'll tackle this one. Um, so my undergrad life, I felt wasn't as focused. Um, I also was in a program that made me learn by myself a lot. Here, the professors, um, they're like guided towards your success. They just want you to succeed. So they give you the resources and put you where you need to be. Um, however, it is a ton more work, but it's completely manageable. Yeah, just to echo what Brendan said, like it, it definitely forces you, um, in undergrad, you could get away with maybe just studying on the weekends before like a Monday test. Um, here, you'll find it far more rewarding if you just study a little bit like each day chunk, um, chunk studying is huge um, but yeah it, it makes you time manage a little bit better than how I did in undergrad so that's the biggest difference for me I don't know if Jake and Ari feel that way but yeah I mean you also you want to remember this material right so you don't want to cram right before an exam you actually want to know this stuff so you can use it in practice so doing the chunks and studying a little bit every day going through quizlets, going through things like that, it, it really helps and keeps in your long-term memory instead of, you know, the short-term we did in undergrad. I agree with Jake on that. It's definitely stuff that we want to make sure that we're learning and retaining, not just brain dumping after. So as they all said, studying in chunks, you can't get away with just cramming the night before and calling it good. There's way too much material. I also think that using different med methods of studying is really helpful. Um, whether that be like studying by yourself, studying with um, friends. Um, we use a lot of Quizlet, but also like writing things out or whiteboard dumping. All those different things are really helpful to make sure that you're retaining information and you can use it in multiple different ways. Right. Uh, how, have you, um, how have you been encouraged to engage with the community? Um, I can talk about this for a little bit. We had, um, so 
there in the summertime, we had a Zoom session with um, what they call leg legacy scholars, which were people from the community. I believe they're all like over the age of like 65. Um, and it was a way for us to practice taking like histories um, with patients. And then um, this coming this fall, we we're going to be doing um, site visits with um, another a pharmacy student and a occupational therapy student um, to like nursing homes or um, assisted living communities to do um, this for our geriatric medicine class to get to know um, so somebody from that community and talk to them. How do you feel the program has supported you so far academically and non-academically? So this is actually a really cool club, which we'll probably get to later, but it's called Medicine Bag. And um, it's not mandatory, but as far as like our mental health well-being, that course is guided to take care of us. Um, also, our professors, I feel like, are dedicated to taking care of us, both as students and as future peers. So I don't know. I think they uh, they do a lot for us. And they also give us the resources like SASE. And there's also counseling on campus in Portland. So there's a lot of resources that are given to us for our success. Um, all right, um, do you see another question? So PA school is often described as drinking from a fire hose. Do you feel the workload is manageable? Are there adequate resources if you need acad ac academic extra help? Um. Oh, um, uh, oh, uh, uh, uh. no, you got it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's a accurate representation, but it's all in how you manage what you're learning in class. Like I'll go to class and then I'll maybe spend like an hour decompressing after class. And then like, I'll review the material we just learned to try to like cement it a little bit more. And it's manageable if you do it in chunks. If you try to like put it off till like two days before the test, you're just going to end up putting yourself in a really hard place. Um, but yeah, when it comes to drinking from the fire hose, it's a lot of information. But I think one of our professors said it pretty well. It makes sure to emphasize on the stuff that's going to be on your boards. Like the stuff they're drilling into your head is the stuff that you're going to get tested on and it, you're, we're going to need it to pass boards. So they're, they're pretty good about that. Yeah. And uh, for the, the drinking out of the fire hose thing, I think the biggest thing for me was that you would, I'll just go back to anatomy in the summer. Cause I, I think that was the best, like that was the best um, to, to compare. Um, so pretty much you would take your, your exam on the Monday and then the Tuesday right after comes around and you have another part of the body. And I think that at the beginning, that was difficult for a lot of us to kind of come to terms with that, that you just studied so much for this one thing and bam, you're right onto the next. You don't even get 24 hours. So just the biggest thing is taking it one day at a time. Like I, at the beginning, I stressed myself out thinking, oh no, I have to learn the entire human body in two weeks. Like I had to take it one day at a time and I got through. So that's probably my best advice. All right, uh, another question. Is there a capstone final research project? Um, this person mentions that with the final week on campus provides a forum for the presentation of students' research projects. So yes, yeah, so could you talk about research projects? We haven't uh, we haven't fully gotten there yet, but we kind of got some information about clinicals with the capstone thing. From my understanding, it's it is a research based project that you get during your clinicals, and you work with one of our adjunct professors. You do your research when you're out on clinicals, and then you come back at the end of rotation weeks, and then you present it to either the class or the administrators. So I think it is technically a capstone project. Um, I don't know if you guys have any more on that or if I'm getting it wrong. All right. Uh, what is the format of the curriculum during the didactic year?
Uh, right now, so well, summer is a little bit different because you have to get like anatomy out of the way, bioscience. Um, we took ethics. So your summer schedule is a little bit more scattered. But once you move into the fall, there's a lot more structure. Um, the majority of your time is spent in clinical medicine. You also have um, clinical assessment and that has a lecture component and a lab component. And then we have integrating seminar, which is um, like more like case-based medicine and practicing writing your soap notes, um, really like kind of putting all of the knowledge together. And we go through in a body system or like body systems format. Um, so like we, over the summer, we ended with um, ophthalmology and then we did um, ears, nose and throat. Uh, this fall, we started out with um, the musculoskeletal system and rheumatology. So you just kind of work your way um, through the different body systems, if that answers that question. Yeah, and we got, uh, I was just reading it like for class length. I don't know if you said all of that. But it's usually like an eight to five schedule every day, but you get breaks. So don't worry, you get breaks. You get a lunch every day from 12 to one. And then we get these wellness breaks where they give us time to decompress and things. Um, and and uh, in the summer for anatomy, when you're driving, because you'll be driving to another campus, um, you also have a little more time there. So you don't have to worry about driving like 90 miles per hour to get there. Great. Uh, so uh, Jake mentioned driving to another campus. So come next fall, next yeah, next fall, summer, um, the med school is moving to our campus. So no more driving. <laughs> Everything, all the, uh, our, our uh, Portland campus will be, will house all our health sciences uh, graduate programs. Um, so um, next question, what do you think helped strengthen your application for PA school? Um, for my application, I, I feel like they, they want to see someone who's well-rounded. Um, I wasn't someone who went straight from undergrad into PA school. Um, so I took, yeah, I graduated undergrad 2020. Um, and then I worked as an EMT, um, then moving to a, uh, big hospital in Boston. Um, then I ended up doing a master's program at UVM. And then I took another two years. <laughs> and then I finally applied to PA school. So it, it it was a roundabout journey, but they want someone, I think, with more experience. Um, real world experience will help you too. Um, there's questions on tests every day that I see that like pop up. And it's because I've seen it in clinical setting that I'll, I'm able to answer the question. But um, yeah, uh, I think as far as work experience, I would say is the biggest. Um, if you can get out and do volunteer opportunities, um, that's huge. Any leadership roles that you are a part of, I think that's really good. Um, they want people who are going to come to PA school with um, good bedside manner, um, being able to talk to people is huge. Um, yeah. And I, I think having good dialogue um, between you and your patients is something they emphasize, at least here at UNE. So I think real world experience helps a lot with that. I definitely agree with what Matt said. I think that well-rounded individuals with different experiences um, and also like they want their class to all bring like different perspectives um, with our, all our different backgrounds. We can Kind of contribute differently to the program. Um, I don't think there's like one like cookie cutter like way or format to like get yourself into PA school, but I just think it's important to be involved, especially in things that you have interest in, whether that be like volunteering or research or different sorts of um, different sorts of like clinical experience. Um, really, everybody has a different background, and just having something that you're interested in, showing that something that you've like committed your time to, is important on your applications. Right. <clears throat> what patient care experience did you did you have did you all have and how did it contribute to your learning experience during the first year so far during the first year? 
Um, I can start. Uh, so I started out as an EMT ooh, at a fire department uh, in Milwaukee for about three years. I, I worked when I was in undergrad there. Um, and then I did a lot of, um, I guess, worldwide uh, international work, which I think is from the previous question, what made me different in my application process. Um, so I did a lot of like, I, I was basically a glorified MA in Sri Lanka, the Maldives. Um, I shadowed a PA in Munich, Germany. They do have PAs in Germany, if anyone wanted to know that. It's not like it is in the US. Um, it's very different. But yeah, I did a lot of those things and did a bunch of shadowing and volunteering in the US as well. Um, I did military medicine for seven years. So I, my experiences ranged from pre-hospital emergencies to emergency rooms to family practice. And then my favorite thing, which was infectious disease. So I think that's also to answer the last question, what probably stuck out on my application. So. All right. Um, what does a typical class schedule look like? Um, frequency, class, class length, uh, uh, number of courses at a time. Um, I think that, like, as Jake was saying, typically we're in class, like, eight to five-ish, sometimes, like, nine. Um, it depends on the day. Pretty much Mondays and Fridays right now, we're in class the majority of the day. Um, and then Tuesdays, we have a lab in the morning. Um, we're split up into two groups. So um, you have, like, a two-hour lab, and then the other group goes for two hours, so you get a break. And then we're in seminar in the afternoon. Um, Wednesdays are typically our exam days. So the mornings are typically that sometimes we have lecture if we don't have exams. And then Wednesday afternoon is typically when we have that wellness block that Jake mentioned. Um, and then Thursdays we have pharmacology in the morning. Um, that's typically like an hour and a half of lecture. And then we do cases for, um, another like hour, hour and a half. And that's, um, again, we're in groups. So you get a break during that time. Um, so some of our lectures, especially for clin cl clinical medicine can be longer, um, like four hours, but, um, we do get breaks about every hour just to like get up, stretch, get a snack, um, so that you're not just sitting there all day, but there's definitely some variability and it's not as, um, I wouldn't say that we're like, as an, we're not in class as much as I was worried we'd be or at like sitting at a desk all day, at least for the most part. Um, but I don't know what else was in that question. If anybody else wants to add on. I also don't know what, what was in that question. <laughs> I would like to add on. All right. Um, let's move on to the next question then. So what are the must have for didactic gear, i.e. like laptops, med supplies, electronics, so forth? Um, I think if you can swing it, I think an iPad is very helpful. Um, as far as taking notes, having all your notes in one place, um, downloading something like Notability, where like you can download the slides from lecture and then write along um, with what the professor's saying. Um, you can add pictures like from the board. Um, yeah, it, it was something that was new. It was new to me. Um, definitely helped me a lot um, with this program, just organizing, having all your stuff on like one thing, um, I think is huge because there's a bunch going on all the time in uh, didactic here. And I think you have to really be organized and be able to keep in, being able to keep that in one place is, is huge. So if you can swing it, I'd say that. Yeah, especially also there's there's some lectures that they give you like 200 plus slides. So it's almost impossible to try to do notes on every single slide without having something electronic to an extent. Some, some people can do it, but if you can swing it, that that kind of saved me uh, in PA school, having an iPad. I don't know if they mentioned this, but also you do need to have a laptop is required for exams and it has to be compatible with um, the Examplify software. And then 
Um, as far as like other equipment though, or like medical equipment, um, UNE gives you a, or at least for our class, we got a medical bag with like a stethoscope and other things like that. So you don't need to buy that yourself, it's provided. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is just one, do you have veterans in your class? Is the program military friendly? I guess I should answer this. Um, we do have veterans in our class. I am a veteran um, and it's very veteran friendly. Uh, the person who manages all of our veteran stuff is very helpful and helps you out. Hopefully that helps. All right. Are any students in your class? Uh, uh, whoa, here we go. Same sort of, uh, Brennan, you might want to answer this one too. Uh, are any students in your class in the military reserves? If so, do they have challenges balancing this with school? I don't know if you'd know that, but. Uh, yes, so I am in the military reserves. Um, it is challenging to balance this during the summer semester. I'm gonna I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You have labs on Saturday. Um, I personally went after a military scholarship program so that I wouldn't have to do drills on weekends. However, drills once a month. So if you balance your time and chunk study, as we were saying earlier, it's, you can manage it. The military teaches you time management. You'll be okay. <laughs> all right. Um, how have you all managed your personal life with the demands of your academic life? It's, it's managed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in the summer, it, I, I won't, I won't lie. It's a little difficult at times because you, like Brennan was saying, you have things on Saturday. You sometimes have things on Sunday. Like you have to study, there's exams in different classes coming at you all at once. Um, but I think once you get into a rhythm and if you stay organized, which is like the next question below that, uh, you have a plan and you stick to it and you do it every day, you get into a routine. It's very, very manageable. And I mean, I talk to my parents, my friends, my brother all the time. Um, I can still play my music whenever I please. I can work out every day. Um, so once I got a got a schedule down, it worked for me. Yeah, I think it's definitely manageable, but I I also think it's like necessary to have um, make sure you're managing it because you need to kind of keep that component of yourself going while you're in PA school. If you're just so in the books and um, only focus on school, it's not going to be good for your mental health and getting through um, getting through the program. So for me, actually, like being so close to home, sometimes it's kind of hard because my family all lives nearby. So there are more distractions and there are people like being like, oh, like, Ari, come over for dinner or something. And I think a lot of times I just found that sometimes it's better to say yes and give yourself that time, like with your family, with your friends, significant others, um, going to the gym doing things that make you feel like a person, not just a student studying all the time. Sometimes it's worth taking that time to do that because the extra maybe hour of studying, it it's not always worth it. Like you're you're gonna know the stuff and you're gonna figure out like what you need to put into it to make sure that you're competent with the material. Uh Z. Um so, uh, so this one person says, Matt mentioned staying organized. What are some of the best practices to help you stay organized? Matt, this is yours. <laughs> Find a buddy who's really organized. <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, that buddy is actually Brendan. Um, but, <laughs> no, I, I, I use my, um, my iPad a lot. I have an agenda book on there. And like, if the date's coming up, um, definitely writing it down every single day up until that date. Um, I also take advantage of Brightspace. Um, it's the program that we use and it has all your classes on it and all your content. Um, also gives you notifications of when things are going to become due. And uh, you can actually download that to your phone. And then you can you, you can play with the settings a little bit but you'll have it remind you like two days in advance or three days in advance. Like mine reminds me two days in advance. And then again, the day of it's due. And then I get it again. I get like a two hour warning. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things in place. And like, believe me, I wasn't the most organized in undergrad. It wasn't until my graduate studies that 
I became organized, actually. Do I have any else? Go ahead. I was just gonna say at the beginning of the semester, like I find it really helpful to just look at um, your syllabus or your supply for all your classes and just write down all the dates um, or put them into a calendar. Um, I also have my Brightspace notifications and that's super helpful, but it's nice for me to see like everything in one place and know what's coming up for the week. Um, it may change, but at least you have something down and you know, these are when my exams are, these are when my assignments are due. Right. Um, as far as your, the cohort in classes, is it uh, in your classes like a 50 50 male, female? This no, is it's a not. presentation because we're definitely more, we have a lot more females. I don't know what the percentage is, but what were you going to say? I think we have 12 guys and started with 38 girls. So <laughs> dude, that math in my head is. It's not a lot of guys. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, uh, this person asks, so he wants to practice uh, ER, austere medicine. Um, does this program expose you to these and various other subfields? Spring semester. Yeah, so yeah, I think so um, we definitely have a clinical rotation that's emergency medicine. It's one of our required clinical rotations. Um, we're not super into, um, like, we're still gearing up for our clinical year, um, but I think we're required emergency medicine, um, two family medicines, and then I think a general surgery rotation. And so you have four that are required, and then you have another four that are elective. No, wrong. Or two elective, six. Two elective? Two elective. Two elective. Okay. Two elective. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. You definitely get exposed to a bunch. I, I really can't speak to it too much because um, we've only, like I said, been introduced to it. Um, but come springtime, I think... Yeah, I think I think it works out to about eight um, rotations. Yeah, the rotations, just to like clarify, it's yeah, the two fam because we're a family medicine driven PA program. That's in there, our mission statement and everything like that. So you have your two family medicine, 100 percent. You have two internal medicine, um, one emergency, one surgery. And then you have a elective that it has to be something around family medicine or internal medicine. So things like pediatrics, mental health, things like that. And then you have one that you can pick all by yourself. And that one is pretty cool. Right. Uh, I guess uh, for those of you from out of state, how do you handle living away from family, significant others, and not getting physically to see them that often? Um, I guess I live the furthest away. Um, it, it's tough at the beginning. I think I, it's, it was a little different for me because I've kind of lived away from my family for a long time, I guess, like four years of college. And then I've lived in multiple other places throughout the world. So it, it wasn't really any different for me, but I will say at the beginning, especially with all the stress that you do feel at the beginning, um, it gets better. Um, it's tough. So you just have to make sure that you give the time to call them if it's possible for them to come to you, because it's pretty difficult if you live far away to go to them, as we have a lot of stuff going on and it's expensive. Just finding that outlet is is pretty nice. And FaceTime calls, they're really good. Yeah, to, to yeah. piggyback on what Jake said, uh, FaceTime calls are huge. Uh, I know me and my significant other, we just schedule like one or two days a week where we have like a two hour uninterrupted FaceTime call. Um, and then I know there's other people in our class though, who they like, they'll uh, travel back to Boston on every other weekend or whatnot. So it's definitely doable. Um, it's not impossible. Um, again, you just have to schedule your time. Is there any time off throughout the didactic year?
Uh, so between summer and fall semester, we had like 10 days, and then we have about two weeks between uh, fall and spring semester. And then I think we have like four days after spring semester, four or five days for spring break, and then we go on rotations. So yes, I think that's our breaks. <laughs> Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Do you have any non-traditional career change of students in your class from completely different fields like media? Um, and do you all know what the age range of the class would be? I don't know that. We do have some, uh, career changer students. Um, one was in the arts and then one was at the beginning he was in a band on the U S Virgin islands. So <laughs> that's a career change. Yeah, so we we have a decent amount. Um, and what was the next part of that question? Uh, what's the age range? Oh, I would say Matt and Brendan and Ari, how old are you? Around 20? I, th <laughs> I think most people are like 20, 22 to 30, but we have upwards of 40s-ish. I don't yeah. know specific ages, it's but... A, it's a big range. Is like I think we have someone who's yeah. 21 and we have someone who's like 48, so... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, what information do you wish you had known on the first day of the program? I think some reassurance, just that like you're you're there for a reason, and I they they say this to you, but you don't you don't believe it. You're just kind of like a little stressed and going through the motions, but just kind of like you're gonna figure it out and you're gonna it's it's gonna like come to you I guess like I don't know we've all kind of figured it out along the way sometimes it takes a little bit longer and honestly we're still figuring it out but like you're you're gonna do it you're gonna get through it you just gotta one step at a time as Jake said earlier you're gonna be really nervous on your first day but then we're like what five six months into it and these people are like your family and it's really fun. Make friends. Yeah, make friends. Um, find your nerd herd and trust the process. Those are the things that I wish I would have known on day one. All right. Um, let's see. What is your favorite part about Portland? Are there housing options for PA students? No. Um, there, there isn't, but there is like, they give you a big, big, big list and a lot of resources to find off campus housing. Um, and it's actually really beneficial. That's how I, I found my house right next to campus, but there is no on campus grad student housing. Um, you have to, you have to find your own. Thing in the yeah, it, it is very, um, that, that list is huge and it might take emailing a couple people and calling a couple people like Jake I I live right across from campus so I I literally walked all my classes so it's definitely doable um so what's your favorite part about Portland there's a lot of good food there's a lot of things to do especially in the summertime which is helpful as much as you don't have too much time um there's things you can get out and do um you're also close to the beach and you're close to i mean you're not too far from the mountains if you like to hike in the winter if you like to ski um that's why i like me and i'm also biased because i'm from here <laughs> anything else uh there's a good one what's your favorite food in portland Lobster. All right. Lobster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well. Uh, let's see. Um, so you guys talked about housing. Did you find it was difficult to find your housing? I, I guess I can kind of say that. I, I kind of started early because uh, I got accepted pretty early and it took me a while to find something that was in my price range because Portland is is a little is a little pricey. It's not super bad, but it, it's pretty pricey. I'm from Minnesota and it's not, you know, East Coast is much different. Um, so it took me a while to find it, but I did find something that was in my range and it all worked out. So you just have to keep pushing because sometimes, yeah, you'll send an email and you'll get nothing back or there 
they're all they will already have someone so you there's plenty of places that you can find and if you're not super close to campus it's okay they have parking lots so uh, so this next question uh jake you're on the on the handle again here uh, could you talk about your international experience more and how you got involved and took the opportunity um yeah so I'll start with kind of the glorified MA thing that I was talking about earlier. Um, I, I kind of just got it brought up to me by one of my mom's friends. She said, hey, you should you should look into doing international work because I really wanted to do it. And she sent me a link. I For some reason, I can't remember the name of the program, which is probably bad, but I bet you could find it if you looked it up. Um, and pretty much you just join with this big group of people from all around the world that are all focused and want to do something with international medicine. You get set up in um, a specific country. So I got thrown into Sri Lanka. So they pay for your housing and your food and everything. You just have to pay for the flight to get there. And pretty much what you do is what an MA would do. I did a lot of wound care though, because in Sri Lanka, there's a lot of, there is a lot of wound care that has to be done. Um, and yeah, for that. And then when I was in Munich and I got set up with that, I just knew a bunch of people from Sri Lanka that I met who were from Germany um, that told me that there's PAs there that I can work with. So I just had a lot of connections, I think, internationally, which is pretty lucky. I think that's difficult to, to find being in the U.S. a lot of the time. But, you know, just getting your foot in the door and asking as many people as you can. And I kind of got lucky. Thank you. Uh, so next question. So did any of you have a specific interest and one specialty before starting PA school and have your interests changed now? Uh, I can take this one. So uh, originally when I started, I loved ortho. I thought that's what I really wanted to do. And uh, then we had our at least didactic um, ortho and I honestly didn't love it. Um, so now I'm kind of keeping my eyes open and yeah. See, keeping horizons broad for sure. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? <laughs> okay. I've always had an interest in rural medicine, so I guess that's still the same for me. I like rural medicine. <laughs> I think it's cool. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, the answer to this, uh, uh, maybe, uh, what is the re remediation process fail for failed exams? Uh, I think it's, I'm glad I don't know this. Um, <laughs> I, I, th I think it's, I think it's, if you get over or under a 74 or 76, then you go with the professor and you go th either go through the questions with them or you retake it but it's a different exam. And if you also fail that one, then there's consequences, but you always get a second chance and you get about, I think it was three or four in the summer and then six, five or six total for fall and spring. I think, I think you only have to like make up the portion that you like failed. So like, um, you get like a breakdown of your exam for some classes or that at least the professor has it. So I believe like if um, I can't think of an example right now, but just because if you maybe your overall grade was a fail, they would look at your breakdown to see um, what specific components of that. And then I think what Jake said, you meet with the professor, but I, I'm not fully sure. Uh, I do know that uh, the professors are very uh, conscientious of students and, and their needs, so they're very proactive in helping anybody that uh, uh, they feel is struggling in a class. So uh, th we do have a lot of support um, within the within the, the university setting uh, for, for students that are struggling. I think we had the thing we could talk about that they, they talked to us when they gave us the remediation brief was um, there's a thing called SASE, um, where they'll actually go over your exams with you 
and that can also help you out and help you grow in the areas that you're lacking in. So. Uh, let's see. Did your class do anything for PA week? Uh, we had a conference that we went to um, for, um, it's called MEPA, and I'm forgetting the whole acronym, but it's the main like PA association. And um, we actually got um, like half of Thursday off and all of Friday off that week to be able to go to the conference. It was completely optional, um, but UNE has um, grant funding so that you can actually um, be reimbursed to pay to go to this conference and um, potentially to stay there up to a certain amount. Um, so I know probably almost 50% of the class went to that and that was um, a lot of fun. So we got to be in the Bar Harbor area, but um, also go to the conference. Great. How many application cycles did it take you to get accepted? Ooh. Anybody wanna share that? <laughs> I, I have some advice for that. So I started applying when I was still in undergrad and I got in my first time, like the, the cycle app, like the year after. Um, and I think just the biggest thing is applying early. Um, there's a lot of rolling admissions and I got all my applications in probably by the end of May and it opened up in April. And that gave me, gave me the biggest chance of getting in because of these rolling admissions where they get you the interviews first over the people who wait a little longer. So I would really try to apply as fast as you can still make sure that it's good, obviously, and make sure you have all the components to apply. Um, but definitely start, start early. I definitely agree with what Jake said. Um, I got in on my first round um, and I was, I think it helped applying early really helps you with the interviews like with you and e, I got um, into their first round of interviews which is really helpful and it reduces some stress on my end but I also think that don't be like discouraged if you're if it's taking you a long time to hear back or if you aren't getting in on your first try or it takes you a couple times like don't be discouraged if you don't get in on your first try all right um I'm not sure what, uh, if either you want to uh, answer this one. So they asked, so what is the admissions time like, timeline like? Uh, when did you interview, get accepted? When did you move to Portland? When did you start class? It's a lot of questions. <laughs> so I applied in June. I got an interview, I want to say in September. I think it was the first round of right after the deadline, whenever that was. Um, and then I got accepted, uh, I think it was like a week or two later. And I moved to Portland in 2022, so I was already living here. And then we started class um, in May, so I had like six months, six, seven months to wait. So that's uh, that was my process. Yeah, I had, a, I had a crazy process that I don't recommend. But I basically moved from Germany back to Minnesota like seven days, six or seven days before PA school started. And then I drove the 26 hour drive to um, Maine and then started two days after that. So it was kind of a crazy time. Uh, does the class, excuse me, does the class travel to the AAPA conference each year? We go to the MEPA, <laughs> the MEPA conference in Bar Harbor. That's close. All right. What do you think? Uh, what do you think? What do you think stood out the most, or different from others, in your application that got you accepted to UNE? I'd say, what makes you unique? So I'll answer your question with a question. Um, what makes you unique? And lean on that. And that's my answer to that. <laughs> All right. Do you feel like public health plays a role in the didactic curriculum? Our spring semester has a public health class, and we also focus a lot on social determinants of health. 
So yes, it does play a role in our didactic gear. We have other questions in the Q and A right now. Um, we have about ten minutes or so left. Ten minutes. We have about ten minutes left. Um, let me ask a couple of questions here. Um, so, uh, what sort of extracurriculars, um, like clubs, organizations, are you all a part of? If any, we have, we have a intramural team going right now for soccer, and I think there's also a volleyball team. Um, and then I think everyone else is kind of everyone has like different things that they do. Um, there's also some like more academic focused clubs um, and different opportunities um, through UNE. I know that some people are in a um, women's health focused club, and then there's also one that works um, that's like an inter interdisciplinary like case-based um, medicine um, club where you like meet with um, students and other programs and kind of go through cases. Um, I'm not a part of either of those, so can't speak on them in too much detail, but I know people um, who are in them. Um, yeah, there's also student government, if um, that's something you're into. Um, I'm the historian currently in our class, um, but there is the president, vice president, treasurer. So there's a there's a long list of roles that you can do. And um, definitely, if you want to put yourself out there and take on a, a little bit of responsibility, it's not completely. Um, yeah, it's not completely not doable. Um, let's see. What is uh, the class size? Are you guys a close as a cohort? Uh, yeah, uh, I think the class size starts as 50, um, which is, that's a good number. I think that's average for a PA school. I know there's some that have big and like a lot of people and some that have small, but I think it's a perfect amount of people to have in a cohort. You can get super close and you can have groups, but you can also be close and tightly knit as an entire cohort. I mean, like I hang out with my group a lot and we do a lot of fun things. We kind of started right at the beginning too. You're kind of just bound together because of how close you have to be every day. Um, I know we sort of bounced around the um, the interprofessional aspect of our program. Could you, any of you speak to that? Um, so in the there's that club that I mentioned, and then in the um, our geriatric um, pro program, there's um, the experience with the um, pharmacy students and with the um, occupational therapy students. And I think as we go, we might have a couple of other opportunities. And I think there's some like extracurricular things that you can do or events to get involved with, um, with other professions to kind of get to know what they do and learn how to kind of use your resources in healthcare. Uh, let's see. Uh, do, do, do. What are the things that uh, you like or dislike about living in Maine or Portland? Though I, I love it. I love it. I mean, that's the reason I came here is because I love it here. Everything about it is amazing. Um, the only thing is driving. I feel like people drive a little slow here. And I, I was confused at that at the beginning. Brand, Brandon's shaking his head for some reason, but... <laughs> I, I I really think they drive a little slow for my liking because I'm from Minnesota, but it's gorgeous. Um, I mean, there's mountains, there's ocean, there's amazing food. You can't go wrong with it. Jake, if you talk crap about Maine, <laughs> I see you on it's Monday. It's not about man. Maine. It's about the cars, the drivers. <laughs> They're probably just being safe, so it's actually better. We're being safe. <laughs> there's moose out here. <laughs> Um, uh, let's see, let's, uh, what is your favorite thing about uh, UNE? Um, if you had to sell a school to someone else, what would be the main selling point? I, 
I think that the um, having the um, gross anatomy over the summer with a cadaver lab is super helpful. I know not all programs have that. And actually being like hands on having that experience is like incredibly helpful to learn anatomy, especially with how fast that course moves. Um, I also really enjoy how in clinical medicine we have um, lecturers that come in to talk about their specialty. Um, so we're not always, um, it's not always the same professor. Um, so you really get people that know what they're talking about and it keeps things interesting to have different styles of lectures and um, definitely holds your, gets your, holds your attention better. So I like that. I also think, I think we're the only program that has the IGEP uh, attribute. I, maybe there's more, but I think we are the only program, which is super cool. I mean, that's a great, great opportunity if you're interested in both rural medicine or geriatric medicine. Um, and then our simulation center, which I'm sitting in right now is pretty amazing. Um, we have like, I would say pretty high tech, high tech stuff going on here. And uh, they, what is it called? The, uh, the simulated patient. Yeah, the simulated patients. And it's just really cool because that's not something that I thought I'd get my hands on. Jay, can you explain, or any of you can you explain what Isaac uh, does? Sorry? Can you sort of uh, go into a little more detail about Isaac? Oh, yeah. It's our, it's our simulation center. It's a pretty, it's in our innovation hall, which is our, one of our big new buildings. Um, and pretty much the biggest thing for us that we've been doing is we do our practicals here and we do our simulations that will start in two weeks here. So they have either a mannequin or a real patient. It depends on which one. And you're given like you're given your your history and everything and you go in and you try to obviously diagnose and treat um, and they can change on their computers, all, all these different settings to make it seem more believable and real. And you have to adapt um, to the circumstances. So it's, it's very cool. The setup of that, of the space too is cool. It looks like uh, like a hospital room where they can set it up however they want. And then um, there's like a, you see a mirror, but like they can see into the room um, and watch you. Um, there's also like recording so you can watch yourself back, which can be awkward, but also really helpful. And then there's also like a debrief room. So people can be watching you or um, you and your classmates while you're kind of running through the simulation, which is um all for the review process and like helpful to um, like review what you're doing and learn from it. All right, I think that pretty much wraps up our, our panel here. So thank you for joining us today, um, uh, this evening and uh, for the uh, student panel, uh, for the PA first year student panel um, tonight. Uh, we hope you found the information useful and helpful. Um, as a reminder, we'll be starting uh, the we'll be sharing this recording out, so you can always check out our YouTube uh, YouTube channel. Where I'll be sending you an email with that link. So with that, I thank our panelists, um, Jess and Cassandra as well. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight, um, and have a good weekend. Take care.